What have the last two and a half years been like for you? Why do the Americans want you so badly? Norman Hasker, Norman Hasker, Bush administration, Obama administration, Norman Hasker, Mrs. Clinton, you could have explained why they mean, I don't know, I have no clue. Well, welcome all you wiretappers out there. I'm back here. It's going to be a special bonus episode. Of Got my friend Ignacio Esteban on the line here on the Zoom call. And, and we were talking recently and this Victor Bout had hit the headlines. And I said, who is this guy? Well, you know, Ignacio's an ATF agent. This guy's a gun dealer. Let's ask uh, uh, Ignacio Esteban about it. And, and he was writing a book. So welcome, Ignacio. Yeah. Oh, Gary, it's a pleasure to be back. I enjoy being on, on your show every time. Good, great. Now, uh, Victor Bout, uh, I noticed as I kind of glanced over his, I didn't really study him out real close. I noticed that DEA was working a case when they ended up getting him, but he was he was a big time gun dealer. And I imagine he ATF knew all about him at some point in time. Uh, For sure. tell, tell us a little more about this guy. Yeah, he, he's definitely an interesting character. I mean, uh, and and even his his where he was born, he, we know he was born in the Soviet Union, right? Born in, in the late sixties. Uh, where exactly? It's it's a little bit confusing. Some places have him in this uh, obscure place called Tajikistan, uh, which is now an independent republic from the Soviet Union. Uh, some people think he's more Ukrainian origin uh, because it, it, well, it was forging. He, he was a master of forging documents and birth certificates, and it's not a lot of great records. In this area, especially in yeah. the '60s, of this guy, um, he 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 seemed like he was the kind of guy. He had a skill for languages. They, they said that he was able to learn. This is what they said. And I was researching. He was able to learn English by listening to a lot on the radio and through television. He, he was very linguistic, so that was a skill that he had. And he wanted. He didn't want to be raised in, in Tajikistan, which I didn't know much about it. So I researched a little bit. It's like ninety percent mountainous, all, all covered out there. And he was in a mountain village, so he didn't want to spend his life race in a mountain village. So he decided to join the Soviet army when he was of age, uh, back in the, uh, early about in the eighties, uh, he went, he went out there and he became a linguistic for the Soviet army. He allegedly, he mastered like six languages, obviously Russian. Yeah. What was the language everybody spoke? That's because even in Tajikistan, there's so many different ethnic groups out there. It, it's just full people. And what kept them together was, was the Soviets. And once that collapsed, and I'll talk a little about there, they went also into civil war. So all these places, when Soviet Union collapsed in these regions, which had control, they all had their own civil wars and everything else. I think that plays a lot into what his mindset and where he goes, what he does after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, so he, he learns, uh, obviously, English, French, Portuguese. Uh, he learns Arabic, Farsi. So he, he becomes very masterful, and, he, and he's competent in many other languages. This is going to play big for him because, obviously, what he does later, he gets in trafficking. Um, he also, they also suspect that with his skills and language, he also starts working, uh, they think, for the KGB, Russian intelligence, mm -hmm. with his background. And that's probably why the connection him and Putin are so close. Uh, because obviously Putin was, you know, prior KGB, they think he was. Uh, and then he was involved in the Angolan Civil War in the late 80s. And uh, he helped uh, supply uh, the weapons intelligence to the MPLA, which was the left-leaning side of the Civil War, the communist side, mm -hmm. uh, that faction back then. So we'll fast forward now uh, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right. This is this is where this is what transforms him. He sees the collapse of Soviet, but he's been part of the Soviet army for, for many years. <clears throat> so he then becomes he gets involved in transporting arms through. Uh, he, he's a good pilot and he able to buy uh, these Soviet transporters. Right. He gets them free and he knows where the weapons are. He knows where to get them because Soviet Union collapsed. He has an idea where everything's located. And he, of course, he has his connections in Africa. And of course, uh, if you haven't seen Lord of War, I recommend your audience uh, to look at the movie Lord of War. It's based, it's Nicolas Cage based on uh, Victor. It's kind of based on Victor Bout's life. And it's also Ethan Hawke who plays a, the Interpol investigator that's tracking him down around the world. So which is cool because they kind of do do that also. Mm -hmm. Interpol, obviously, but with DEA and, and uh, ATF and other agencies working together. Uh, so he becomes, and, and that's the name of my book, one of the most notorious, uh, um, notorious arms dealers in the history of the world. Pretty much what he did because he, he really didn't didn't care who he ended up supplying. You, you could be on the left side, you could be on the right side, you could be a terrorist, you you could, you could be a tyrant. He he doesn't care. He dealt with everybody. If you had the money to pay for it, and a perfect example of that was uh, was um, uh, Charles Taylor. He he was the uh, the warlord dictator of Liberia mm -hmm. back in the in the nineties, 
And he was famous enough, and they, they depicted in the movie and the research, uh, there's documentation of him going out there. And it's very dangerous to go all these places. But he, he didn't care how he got paid. He was getting paid with blood diamonds because uh, this guy, Taylor, was funding the war also in Sierra Leone next to him because he was, you know, depleting their resources and using their resources to end up supporting himself. And he didn't care. He, he doesn't really care because it wasn't only about, you know, the fighting each other, but poor civilians who get massacred, innocent people get massacred. And he and he really cared. And so he sent Africa because of his connections, and he was supply a lot. And obviously, he went back to Angola. And Angola, remember when he was with the Soviets, he was helping the left, MPLA. He would now supply the other side. <laughs> so he, he didn't care what side you're on. As long as you had the resources somehow to pay him, uh, he would do that. So he, he changed Africans' wars from being from using machetes to now using AK 47s and everything else in between. So he, he really would be the guy who, who would change and make a bloodbath in Africa during the 90s. And you remember the atrocities coming in the 90s and 2000s yeah. and stuff yeah. with him. Um, so he, he's an interesting guy there. Uh, and then he gets involved in other countries. I mean, um, after 9 11, um, he felt because he, remember, he was from Tajikistan. He has connections a lot to Afghanistan. Yeah. And that's close. A, yeah. A, a, after 9 11, he was public, public number number two. He said he woke up on September 12th, and this is his words, and I was reading, he had to go to Russia and do some interviews and tell people, hey, listen, I, I wasn't supplying guns to Al Qaeda or the Taliban. That's what he said. He said he was only supplying guns to North, the Northern Alliance mm -hmm. in Afghanistan d during the war, and he had a lot of connections there. And he could speak Arabic. He could communicate a lot with these people that are going out there. Um, but then that's kind of because a lot of people said that he did have connections, but he felt like he was now a target by the Americans, and he had to be careful mm -hmm. because now they thought that he was also arming one of our enemies. And he really will say later w with this huge sting that he really was also at war with the United States. He, he didn't really care much about us either. And, and, mm -hmm. and what we did, because obviously he, he was part of the Soviets, which were war with, with the United States. And then, of course, later. So that's part of his mindset, which I'll talk a little more about that. Um, so th then you go up for that war there. Uh, he he send, says, OK, fine. He supplied the weapons to there. Then he starts supplying weapons in Somalia. Right. And he gets mm -hmm. involved with Al Qaeda in Somalia there. And some of the missile launchers, some of the um, surface air missiles were used in a major Israeli attack back in like early 2000s, like mm -hmm. 2003, 2004, where they went after an airliner and then used a car bombing and they attacked a hotel and killed like 50 people inside the hotel room. Uh, some of the weapons that were used there were traced back to that he was behind that. So he, he was supplying a lot of people weapons around. Uh, after the death of Gaddafi uh, during the civil war that he had, they, they said he, so Gaddafi had books in Tripoli where he had mentioned about and he had been a big player in Libya also. So hmm. he, he is all over the world. Really? I mean, you got Terrence all over it. And Victor Bout's face and picture, he is the guy. If you need weapons and you're in, in one of these countries, you're looking at him to help you find a way to do it. So now we go to 2008, right? How, how did Victor Bout get, get caught up in this elaborate sting by the DEA, which is, which is pretty impressive? I know we had talked about the one in Yakuza a little bit. Right, which was, that took three years. They did this one in about four or five months. Really? Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 really impressive and really creative how they came up with the story <laughs> and how because Victor Bout really was a man of mystery. Nobody knew where he lived uh -huh. because he had all these bogus identifications. Uh, he wasn't in Russia. He 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 would live all over the world and he would hide all over the world. And even when he delivered weapons, a lot of these third world countries or these countries would offer him, "Hey, you can stay in a hotel and everything else." He never did. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, he liked to stay near his crew, near his plane, in case he had to be a quick getaway. <laughs> I don't blame him in that world. <laughs> no, I guess he, he learned his experience for that. They think get ugly really fast. If you're in the Congo in the Civil War, yeah. and he's applying weapons, you'll be able, be able to get out fast. Yes. And uh, th that's what he said. And he, and he learned. I mean, he was smart that way. Because if you're away in the city, there's no way you can escape. They're going to capture you. So yeah. I guess he realized he needed to be close to his planes to, to get out of the, uh, to out of the area. So... They, they came up with a story, which is ingenious. Uh, and so when I were looking at 2008, the FARC, and this is in Colombia, is a uh, communist left organization. They're fighting the hills uh, against uh, the, 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 the government and the United States, right? They're, they're pumping a lot of cocaine to the United States, and they're considered a terrorist organization. They have a, um, two cooperators, allegedly, who were high-ranking members of the FARC because they couldn't use agents. So they end up using informants and cooperators mm -hmm. to get Victor Fout, get Victor Bout. 
And uh, these guys end up meeting with a business associate, what they call a co-conspirator of them. They start meeting him in Curacao. So they start with a meeting in Curacao and say, hey, they're working for the FARC, and we're looking for a huge load of weapons to fight the Americans. And they're, they're representing themselves as FARC, and they want you know, 800 Stinger missiles. They want 30,000 AK-47s, wow. millions of rounds of ammunition. They want thousands of grenade launchers. They want unarmed drones. I mean, you, you name it, it, it is a, a list that's probably worth over $50 million. Wow. But, but so the FARC They have made drugs. all this money from cocaine, I, I would yes. guess. Yes. So uh, Park, from, from the streets of the United States, all those little $25, $50, $100 deals ended up buying $50 million worth of weapons for a left-wing communist-backed guerrilla group in Colombia. That's crazy. The, the FARC. Yeah, absolutely. Even though now they don't exist anymore, right? They, they had the peace, and they, and they, but back then they were big. But mm -hmm. a little side note, they did elect just recently a communist, another, another Hugo Chavez in Colombia. So. Mm -hmm. I think it backfired. Yeah, uh, Gustavo Prieto just won the uh, Prieto won the election. So that's another issue we can talk about later. Yeah. So they have the meeting. The co-conspirator goes, "Okay, in Curacao, I like what you're saying. I got to go to Russia and talk about." So for a lot of these meetings, they have the informants and they're meeting with his business associate, his co-conspirator. Then they meet in Denmark. They have another meetings. Okay, things are going well. They're talking more about what they want. So it's showing that these guys are real and they can travel. They have another meeting in Romania. Okay, he's also meeting. So this continues. This is in a few months, two or three months. This is going well, 2007 to 2008. All right, this is going well. He says, okay. Uh, he gives them their e his personal email. He, the, the associate even puts him on the phone with them. That's how good Victor so Victor Bout's a man of mystery who's hiding the shadows. They got him out, which is, shows how, how much they believed it. And they said they were high-ranking FARC members. He said he had a picture, according to indictment, because I'm reading the indictment. It was pretty detailed indictment that the DEA came up with uh, when the time of the arrest. Uh, show me who you are in this picture that I found of high-ranking FARC members. So that tells me these guys were. They didn't say explicitly, yeah. but they got these guys to work with them. They so did. that's how they end up getting Victor Bow. He said, man, if they got FARC guys, he probably said, no way will these guys ever work with the Americans. Most mm -hmm. likely, in his mind, I feel safe. Because right after they, he saw the picture and they circled it, he said, okay, let's meet in a couple weeks in Bangkok. And let's make this happen. That's how quickly things changed. Mm -hmm. So now you look at March 2008. Uh, you have two co conspirators, two cooperators, and the uh, other co conspirator. And finally, Victor Bout shows up. They go in a hotel up in Bangkok for a two hour meeting. According to the indictment, everything's recorded. And, and he and they start on amazing things that come out that he says it's unbelievable. <clears throat> he said, You know, I support your cause. I understand. I'm also at war with the United States. So what you need, I have no problem getting. Uh, pricing, they mentioned over, I think, like $25, $30 million. I don't think they say dollars, $35 million. So it could have been paid in any, any way they wanted to. And he said, yeah, I'm, I'm also at war. So you're, you're, you're at war with them. I'm at war with them, pretty much mm -hmm. what he's saying. So he, he had no problem giving what you wanted. You wanted 800 um, uh, Stinger missiles or you want to service air missiles, uh, AK-40, you, you name it. And if you need people, to help you train for it, I got people to help show you how to use it if you don't know how to use this stuff too. And he was willing to do airdrops, how to get it in there quietly. I mean, he was really getting into the details how to do this. Uh, but he had no qualms knowing that these people, and knowing, I mean, they made it clear to him that this was going to be used against the Americans, mm -hmm. the United States military, uh, personnel, D agents, any other agents out there, anybody out there, shoot down helicopters. This was going to be used against the United States. I have no problems with that at all. I'll help you out. So this, wow. this guy is not, he's not a good guy. No, he's not. <laughs> That's, it was and amazing. It, I wonder how they turned those fart guys. I, uh, I got a feeling that somebody must have had their wives and children <laughs> at risk or something. I, th I think, the, 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 I think they saw the end of the fart coming. It, it was going uh, a while and, and the peace started and uh, they must have had them, some pretty good charges with them. And you're right. And, 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 and they, they got him because this was an unbelievable sting to pull this off. Yeah, Creative stories. Right. Yeah using South American angle in Colombia. So soon after that, the meeting ends, he comes down and the Thai police pop him. Mm -hmm. He's arrested in Thailand, Bangkok, right there. Uh, then there's a big battle for about two years extradition. It wasn't easy, but finally the United States got him extradited and, and prosecuted in the Southern uh, district of uh, New York and Manhattan. Oh, wow. Yeah. So a uh, DEA plane that you, I don't know if your, your viewers go online, 
you can see the famous pictures of uh, about being escorted by DA agents, right? Yeah, I've seen going that. on a D, DA charter plane and and going back to the United States. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. And, and, and the Russians, you know, Putin did not want him going because obviously he he they, they a lot of people think if he wasn't still Russian intelligence, he was an asset. Yeah, of the Russians. Yeah, being no doubt about he, it. He he was getting information, giving information. And, and uh, you know, he's very close to Putin. I'll, I'll explain some other things that he did with Putin. So he gets sent over. Uh, within a few months, the trial starts. He fights it and uh, he's convicted. His business associate, his co-conspirator, decides to cooperate and testifies against him also. Mm. So you've got the two DEA informants and a co-conspirator against him. He's convicted. He's convicted on the conspiracy charges to provide material to a terrorist organization, the FARC. And conspiracy to kill Americans in uh, in Colombia. Mm-hmm. So he gets he gets four counts and he gets twenty five years. So that's why he's sitting right now in a federal penitentiary in uh, Marion, Illinois. Uh, oh, he's there. up in Marion. I'll be darned. Uh, so uh, tell me something. I, I don't know if you ran it or figured this out. Are all these like international? They made after nine eleven, especially they made certain crimes international crimes. Are they all prosecuted in the Southern District of New York when there's you know all the, the all the activity was outside the United States? Is that just like the default that they go to? It, it appears so. I, I've seen case after case. Right. Uh, in, in, my, in my my experience, it seems like nine uh, eleven changed that area. Yeah. Before and after. Because, you know, you know, New York's considered, you know, a blue state, very liberal in some ways. Mm-hmm. But that era, that obviously changed the whole dynamics and very pro law enforcement, pro investigation. And a lot of the big cases, some of the ones I had went through that channel. OK, so it's just the prosecutors are very aggressive yeah. out there, which which is good because you, you need nothing is worse. Like I said, I've done cases where you put a lot of time in and you get a prosecutor that's that's soft, doesn't really do a good job. And the case falls apart. So yeah. it, it's a team effort. You need an all end to, to make something work like this. Uh, no, no doubt about it. So, uh, yeah, he, he ends up getting uh, 25 years. He's sitting there right now. And, and they said one he didn't cooperate. He didn't cooperate. He didn't want to give information about Putin. He didn't want to give about, about Russian intelligence or anything like that. Kept his mouth shut. He did it, got 25 years. They say that Putin rewards loyalty. Mm-hmm. And the only picture he has there is of Vladimir Putin. And he's supporting the Ukraine war. Mm-hmm. So. He, he knows where he he's hoping Putin's still around if he gets out, because if not, <laughs> he's in trouble. If, uh, well, his, tra- his tragedy backfired on him, right? Yeah, really. Well, maybe they can make a deal for him. That's kind of the second part of this uh, yeah. show here, folks. Uh, if you know that uh, uh, this Brittany Griner, the woman's basketball player from the United States, got popped in Russia and they gave her nine years for having a trace amounts of, I believe, uh, a hash oil or some kind of, you know, substance, uh, uh, but a high tra- trace amounts. And it's just a setup deal. It looks to me yeah, like, yeah. don't you think? Oh, I agree 100%. Uh, I think the state department also says that this, this, uh, this is becoming Putin's political uh, strategy here, a ploy that, he, that he's doing. He's, he's, he's trapping Americans, foreigners on bogus charges and then try exchange with prisoners that are serious threats to national security. I mean, there's no doubt that Victor Ballot is, is a clear and present danger to our national security yeah, and to no the doubt. world's security. I mean, he, he he needs to finish his time. Uh, what I was reading, a lot of people feel like it will be a slap to their face, especially DE agents who risk their lives or the operations mm-hmm. if he doesn't do his time, right? Yeah. If, if he goes back oh, to Russia, he'll just start operating again like he did I before. Think so. I don't I think you? So. Yeah, he, he's only mid-50s. He's yeah. in good shape. Yeah. He got, he got was in the army. I mean, he's the guy will go right back at it again and, and he'll change his whole identity. He'll, he'll, now with surgery, you can really do a lot of stuff and he'll, he'll, he'll change his whole look. He'll change everything about himself because he was making, I would say close to a billion dollars yeah. with everything he was doing. He's a very rich guy. Yeah. So he's I know got they a ton had, of money he had out there. He does. That's what I was reading. He does have, even though here in the U S uh, back before he was popped in 2005 and six, FBI and, and OFAC, Office for Asset Control and Department of Treasury, uh, had some good seizures of stuff that he owned here. But he he was, he was operating here too, so uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't care. I mean, the guy is has uh, like I said, he doesn't care what side you're on, mm-hmm. left or right. Because look at that, he deals with the left, he deals with the right, he deals with terrorists, he, he dealt with a lot of terrorists. He dealt with Al Qaeda, he dealt with these guys, the FARC, 
I mean, and they were clearly saying, we're going to use this against the United States, against our military, against mm -hmm. our personnel. And he didn't blink in the recording on what reading and everything else. He had no, he had no problem. So he, he, he got lucky. In my, my opinion, you know, 25 years was light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he he should have been life. He should have yeah. been life. Hopefully, if it does get released, the International Criminal Court, which still has a lot of interest in him, he could be transferred over to The Hague to be charged internationally because he still has stuff going on that happened around the world. Yeah. You know, homicides and killings, you know, that, that, that he was, you know, supplying part of conspiracies with these terrorist groups. So, yeah, if they don't make no. the deal, then he'll do about 23 or so years. That's it. And, That's it. and he'll still be, you know, <clears throat> you know, there'll still be homicide charges out there, sounds like, in the uh, uh, international court that they could. I hope so. I take hope so. Because directly from custody there, because if he goes to Russia in a deal, he disappears. Oh, he he's disappears. Gone. Yeah. He's still no, no one will ever see him again. He, he'll go back in the shadows. He was almost impossible last time. It, it wasn't for this really creative uh, operation and sting yeah. that they got and with, the, with the luck of the FARC to do the cooperation to do this. I think he really scratched his head. He says, no way. He probably thought high-ranking FARC members working for the U.S. government, impossible. Yeah. He probably said impossible. Yeah, that was uh, so, somebody thought big in the DEA. That's uh, one of our uh, American bureaucrats usually don't think that big, especially on the upper echelon. A street agent yes. will think that big, maybe. Yes. And then yes, nobody will ever back him up. They'll say, well, you're nuts. We get in trouble for this. But somebody on a high level was thinking big back then. I don't know who it was, but I, pl I applaud him. They they pulled off the one, one operation just just like the the one with the yakuza which is imp impressive. I know we have yeah. a show coming out with the yakuza. Right. I, I think there there'll be that was it took three years to finally get that guy. Yeah, but they arrested him in New York City. They finally got out of Morton Steakhouse at the end. He he, <laughs> he 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 came into the U.S. This guy was never going to come to the U.S. Yeah, the, 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 ba Bangkok. Was... Yeah. So that's a. Uh, uh... Let's talk a little bit about this whole deal now. Uh, Brittany Griner was immensely popular there. Uh, didn't you tell me that? I, I didn't really know much yeah. about her. I don't follow women's basketball, but she was immensely yeah. popular in women's basketball in the U.S., but also in Russia. And been there. How long has she been there? Seven years, so I was reading. Wow. Seven, seven years, and she had a lot of records. She's a great athlete, a very good athlete. Uh, she holds a lot of records in the WNBA. She holds a lot of records in the Russian League also. Uh, they, they like her a lot, but Putin doesn't care, right? Yeah, right. He he, he 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 saw this as a good opportunity to make it work. I, I think this is what I'm seeing also with Paul Wallen. Of course, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Former Marine there, he was there for a wedding. Um, it could be some issues there. But again, you look at Victor Bao, what he's done, right? Where he weighs and, and, and totalitarian to a Griner, who was a little bit of weed, and Wallen maybe had something, maybe not, uh, and right. some other. You would have to have like 25 people at least more not just yeah. two Americans <laughs> to, to equal this, and even this, uh, even then, I don't think it's a good deal. Uh, this guy's really because he, he's a clear and present danger, he's going to go back and do a lot more. Yeah. And he's angry now, right? Yeah, he's he's done since he's been in custody since 2008. He, he's he's not going to be well, he's going to want to get something involved and say, you know what, I'll, I'll supply even more enemies of this country and we'll do more things wherever you yeah. want me, I'll put more guns in, and, and he, he, he won't care so. Uh, at the end, I, I found that fascinating, interesting. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff out there on him, on the operation, on this exchange. That's what they're, they're talking about. That's what Common write it. Uh, I hope they don't do it, but she should be out. And um, maybe at the end, Dennis Rodman goes out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, uh, folks. Uh, if you've been keeping up on the news, our uh, former NBA uh, 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 <laughs> bigger than life character Dennis Rodman is, is going out to Russia to make some kind of a deal like he did with with uh, what's his Kim name Jung. in, in uh, Kim Jong Kim Jong Un in uh, North Korea his best buddy <laughs> oh my gosh he, he he ended up playing basketball and, and doing all that I don't know if Putin will you know entertain <laughs> anything like that I, I'm not sure what he's going to do out there uh, he, like he's he, I, I think he's going to end up getting incarcerated, but it could. I, I got news from right. Putin is not Kim Jong Un, uh, who's kind of a, a big child. Putin yes. is one dangerous dude who will use you and abuse you to get whatever he wants. Especially, he's former KGB. So don't ever forget <laughs> right. that. Don't ever forget what what he is. Former KGB. <laughs> you know that's what uh, Senator McCain said, right? When I looked him in the eyes, what did I see? KGB. KGB, KGB. <laughs> yeah. And look at that. He hasn't changed. He, he wanted to make now Russia another Soviet Union. So yeah. 
that and that's all part of this. This is all a ploy. This is part. This is our new Cold War, but this time with Putin. Putin's Cold War. Yeah. Before going. Hopefully, it stays cold, right? <laughs> yeah, really. Yes. Yeah, we don't need the hot war. <laughs> no, no. But it's a good read. It's a Victor Bout, the world's most dangerous arms dealer. All right. Uh, fascinating look into him. Good short read. Not too bad. And of course, I got my other books out there too. Yeah, you got quite a few folks. Just uh, go to Amazon and and search uh, under authors, or just for search your uh, Ignacio Esteban's name, and you'll find yes. a whole bunch of different books of about any subject and. And mainly in crime, but travel and and uh, what other kind of titles you've got? Uh, oh, be, some be, political be things, political uh, and, and some of the world, world's worst tyrants we, I, we've dealt with. A good book on Gaddafi and Mohammed Ben Salman. Uh, all, all these guys have been obviously in the news. Yeah, it's it, fascinating that Bout was in Libya. I mean, yeah, he, he, that was fascinating. He he, he, he arm anybody, any terrorist, yeah. and he was the enemy of the state too. So that's what I'm saying. He, he's he's a bad guy. He's a Soviet. He, he believes that they should be the superpower, and uh, he, he got brainwashed into that mentality, just like Putin has, right? Mm -hmm. Like he said, the fall of the Soviet Union was the worst thing that ever happened. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? That, that was the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> <laughs> Especially for well, well, uh, anybody who believes in democracy. They, they're just, uh, you know, Stalin and the Harak. So, you know, and you like positive. I talk about Putin, too. Putin's tyranny, well, all the stuff he's done. So a little bit of everything, folks. If you like a little bit of stuff like that, uh, and, of course, organized crime, Right. Right. One percenters and stuff. One percenters. I'm kind of now. I'm kind of leaning now doing a book maybe on Taco Bowman. So we'll see. Oh really? Okay, interesting. We got the book. We just I just released the one on Sunday Barger the other day and uh, uh, the Hell's Angels and we got the Yakuza coming up uh, coming out and and this is going to come out before the Yakuza because I wanted to get this on out because this is kind of a, a, a you know people are interested right now in Victor Bout. He is. Everybody's asked me about him. I say, I saw that. What, what's this guy about? What's going on here? Yeah. And uh, and also watch the movie Lord of War. You get a yeah. good feel for him too. That's a good one. And a, a good one that accompanies that one will be the one. Well, Blood Diamonds, Leonardo DiCaprio, because Victor Bowser was arming these guys, right? Yeah. And, and and Sierra Leone and what happens and because those Blood Diamonds are used to pay a lot of these people off. So the exploiting and pun, plunging on these these poor uh, African countries to take care of these wars. So mm -hmm. that's a good company movie. Also, if you haven't seen those two movies, I think they're good. Yeah. Uh, I, believe, I believe there's a documentary about Victor oh, yeah. Bout too. And I can't remember that. Yeah. I had it. I just looked it up and I, all of a sudden I've lost the name to it, but just Victor Bout documentary and you'll, you'll find that too. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of good reads, a lot of good reads out yeah. there. I, I read a copy of my bibliography too. information you can look into oh, and good. stuff like that. Yeah. BBC had a good work. I mean, everybody saw that, but everybody really says one thing about this. If anything else, is what a stunning, unbelievable operation was pulled off to get him. <laughs> cool. The, the guy in the shadows. So, you know, hats off to our, our country and our government, and hopefully he stays in, I think, yeah. at the end. Let's hope. Uh, I'd like to see Brittany Griner get out, but uh, yes. I feel like she got such a raw deal. Uh, uh, Paul Whalen, uh, he was probably set up. It's hard to tell, so. but he, he probably was set up with some uh, – uh, looked like he had classified information in his hotel room. That'd be in Russia. It'd be pretty easy to uh throw a thumb drive in somebody's hotel room and then go find it that's 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 old that's classic old time spy stuff there and, and it's other americans who are also sitting there who, who really shouldn't be doing the time they're doing also yeah so uh, it's it's a lesson learned if if you're thinking about trying to russia i sure wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't either <laughs> I tell you what, any more guys, yeah, I wouldn't go to Mexico or South America, or Central America or it's, Russia. It's, it, it, it's getting bad everywhere. It's getting bad everywhere. Really? I, I, I think I feel maybe safe. We're thinking about maybe going to Canada over this next summer. <laughs> yeah, I'll be pretty safe going to Canada. <laughs> well, we hope, right? <laughs> we hope. You don't know those uh, those French separatists up in Quebec. <laughs> I'm just kidding you, my Canadian friends up there. <laughs> I didn't mean to open an old wound. <laughs> or, or be or be careful with with the uh, some of the out, the Hell's Angels, some of the other biker groups, right? Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did write a book about how how in Canada. Funny you said them. Obviously, farms trafficking is a big thing because I was involved in that. Obviously, in South America, but also the Canadians have a big problem with that. And um, you know, you look at Toronto, Vancouver, and you look at Montreal. Street gangs are also flourishing a lot. Toronto has yeah. really changed a lot. And uh, a lot of the Bloods of Crips, the Mexican Mafias, all those groups are flourishing just like they do in the U.S. Yeah. They're there. So the Canadians do have their, their fair share of crime. And they're looking for a lot of them. And they love American guns. And there's a huge pipeline 
of American farms or imported guns into Canada because everything's illegal. And, and now uh, Thoreau, uh, Thoreau um, he wants to ban handguns too in huh. Canada. So you, you can't, I, I mean. I know they were kind of restricted up there. That, oh my gosh. Uh, I had it's, a friend it's, it's ridiculous. that that he had to go check his gun out to go yeah. to the range and shoot it or something. I didn't quite understand it. I just thought, wow, that's a lot of work. But as you know, folks, you guys know, Ignacio yeah. will damn sure in his life and his career can verify firsthand that just because you ban guns doesn't keep the criminals from getting guns. Oh, no. no. Like like I said, uh, gun-free zones means one thing, right, Gary? Yeah. That Easy nobody, targets, soft targets, and you're coming after target. us. Yeah, you're a soft yeah. I think target. We, we talked about that in Mass Shooting Show, right? Yeah, right. Oh, oh. No, if you haven't seen that one, please go check that show out. I think you really will enjoy yeah. that one also. We've yeah. done quite a few. I think we did one with your with a panel. I was a guest. Yeah, with we, panel. we did just we, uh, folks. If you if you are one of the supporters of the podcast, uh, in some matter, why I have a private Zoom call about once a month, and Ignacio was on that recently, and and they all loved it. The guys that were there could could call in, loved it, and uh, great I, uh, questions. And, and the ones that missed it i sent them out a, a link to it and, and so be a supporter of the podcast and you can get involved with that we'll probably have ignacio back on there again he seemed to have fun and i know the guys really liked having you on there oh and i love the questions and, and, yeah, I, and I, I have such a questions. variety of things to talk about right yeah it, it, it's not just law enforcement even though that's, that's my background right but I, I i also love to research in history and and that's how like i said i was the accidental agent because i almost <laughs> i almost was going to law school i was studying at fiu international relations and I already have yeah, my bachelor's in political science. And I love, ever since I can remember, love politics and history. Yeah. So I love to dig into that stuff. So right. hopefully we have more right. good conversations like we that. We will. We will, Ignacio. All right, folks, don't forget. I uh, appreciate you coming on, Ignacio. Oh, thank and you. don't forget to look out for motorcycles. And you can support the podcast in a variety of manners. And if you got PTSD, if you were a vet, why uh, go to the Veterans Administration website and find that hotline. There's some help available there. All right, Ignacio, thanks a lot. All right, Gary. Thank you. Take care, man. Say bye.